uh, here recently dealing with the end times. And I was thinking about what it's going to be like as we go into the time of the Lord's coming back. The Bible says it's going to be like the days of Noah and like the days of Lot. And so if you know anything about those times, just before God's you know, ultimate judgment came down in the form of fire in one case uh, and in the form of water in another, we have a picture of, of uh, the worldwide judgment, uh, the rain that came down in Noah. And then we have the Bible says that the Lord is going to uh, burn the earth. He's going to raise it with fire. In the last days, uh, the Bible tells us that he's going to do that, not with water this time, but he would do it again with fire. But he didn't, it was a, the worldwide flood. Uh, the flood in Noah's day was a worldwide flood, but the flood, uh, the, the, the uh, fires of Sodom and Gomorrah were symbolized uh, there, the, the symbolized the worldwide fire, the God raining down fire upon the whole earth. And just before the Lord comes back, the Bible says it's going to be, uh, the earth is going to be like the days of Sodom and the days of uh, Noah. And so what do we know about the days of Noah? Of course, well, the days of Noah were very violent. Um, the sin of Cain was not corrected. It was not punished. And people, the Bible says violence filled the earth and the thoughts of men were wicked continually. Uh, what about the days of Sodom and Gomorrah? We know that things had accelerated just in, incredibly fast. Uh, once this, um, this, this group was allowed to just uh, keep going and doing all of these horrible things that they did. And you think about the whole town uh, being a part of just coming out in, in a riotous way and trying to hurt and rape and, and uh, just very, very devilish things that were going on in Sodom. And I think we're seeing those things, but that's not the sermon today. Uh, I'm gonna just kind of, uh, it, you know, bringing this uh, up as we think about this. But um, I believe that there's a very significant picture, even in Christ's life, uh, that is a warning to us. And I think if we can take application from this, it would be helpful to us because the Lord has le left us as sheep in the, uh, in the midst of wolves. Now, he didn't leave us defenseless. Thank God we have the weapons of our warfare. They're not carnal, but mighty through God. And we have lots of spiritual defense weapons, or defense pieces, right? We have the breastplate of truth. Oh, man, don't they hate the truth? Two plus two equals five if I want it to be. Oh, there's hundreds of genders, you know? Nope, nope, truth. Ah, truth, ah, there's no truth. Sure. There is no truth? Is that the truth? Oh, you know. So, truth is our, is our it defends us, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet of, of the gospel, the preparation of peace, going out preaching the gospel. The Bible gives us all these things. The shield of faith. And uh, so... <clears throat> Where I'm going with this, uh, I'll explain it in just a moment, but let's just go ahead and pick up reading in John chapter 6. Many, therefore, of his disciples, uh, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying, and who can hear it? And when Jesus knew in him that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? John 6, 62. What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Is it the spirit that quickeneth, the, and the, the flesh profiteth nothing? The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. Notice this. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given uh, unto him of my father. And from that time, many disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he was... And for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, <clears throat> this is an interesting verse here, and I preached on this topic before, but I'm going to go into, go into depth on it. But basically, you notice here, 
that there's this, this purge that happens. He, he, he points out that some of them don't believe. Now, we're not talking, when he says the disciples, we're not just talking about the 12. We're talking about, remember, he sent out 62 by 2. And there were many people that were following Jesus. And he points out that some of them don't believe. Some of them don't believe. And then, but he specifically meant, uh, the Bible specifically mentions that there's one that hung around who would betray him. So there are times, there are people that will come into church that don't believe, but they come in anyway, right? And they say they believe, and they act like they believe, and they, 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 they pretend to, to believe. And so we see in verse number 70, he said, Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. It's fascinating. Well, I'm going to talk about Judas Iscariot, and I'm going to talk about eternal security for a few minutes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please help me as I preach. Make this... Uh, Lord, clear and uh, a blessing to people, God, and help us to beware and uh, take take the message to heart. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, people with a false gospel will often bring up a few Bible characters to prove that you can lose your salvation. And, you know, um, Brother Frank was just talking to somebody about how, you know, hey, suicide, right? You know, you can't, can't do that one and still go to heaven. And, of course, it's a misunderstanding of what gr- salvation is. Because once you're saved, you're always saved. And uh, praise God for that. So even the sin of suicide, that's a horrible sin, uh, is covered by the blood. It's forgiven by the blood. And it comes the idea that you could lose your salvation uh, based on a, a committing of a suicide is a, comes from a false gospel where they are trusting in their works to get them to heaven. So the Catholic Church teaches that you, you can't, uh, atone for that sin or show remorse or go confess that sin so guess what that sin is unpardonable that's how they'll say it so you know because that you know you can't go to the priest afterwards you know the guy in the dress behind the little you know one-way mirror or whatever uh he can't you know say his little thing to you and forgive you, you know, atone for your sins or whatever and give you a little things to do uh then but then there's other groups out there like the pentecostals who will often say this as well and because they say you have to confess every sin and repent of every sin. And not just do that, but every sin you commit every day, you've got to keep confessing them. Because if you don't confess them, then you go to hell. But thank God it's not that way. Because talk about a hamster wheel to nowhere. I mean, you know, there's no way we could even confess every sin because we don't even realize every sin. And we couldn't even remember every sin, even if we did realize they were sins, because our memory's faulty. And so, uh, thank God that's not what it is. But, but it's funny that people would love to use uh, Judas to prove that you could lose your salvation. I know Gunny brought this up to me. I re- still remember the story how he you, you know, uh, you know, stumped that guy and showed him. Because he brought up Judas. And I remember him telling me how he showed him how Satan entered into his mouth. And uh, when somebody you were working with, because he's like, yeah, you can lose your salvation because Judas. And so that's what I'm going to talk about for just a few minutes, because um, uh, I remember years ago, uh, Brother Jesse and I had a, we were going soul winning uh, out on the base, um, out at uh, the one Cherry Point, and there was this false prophet um, that we ran into, and, you know, he brought up Judas, you know? Um, How can it be once saved, always saved? I mean, Judas was one of the disciples, and, you know, the Bible says he, you know, he wasn't saved, right? Or he didn't get, he lost the salvation was their idea. You know, uh, Judas, they say Judas, oh, he was truly saved. And then he lost it when he, somewhere near the time when he betrayed Jesus. But, you know, what I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer that question. Uh, I don't believe that can be true at all by, based on the scripture. Because once you're saved, you're always saved, obviously. And now this false prophet that was going door to door, you know, that, that he was saying this, you know, once saved, always saved is a false gospel. Because it teaches that you can go to heaven with sin in your life. And they'll say this, oh, you know, that's a dangerous doctrine. What's saved, always saved. Because that means you can live any old way you want to. They give you a license to sin. But thank God that, you know, I mean, this guy doesn't have any idea or concept of what forgiveness is all about. Or, or the grace of God. And praise God that he saves us and completely saves us. His mercy is everlasting. And Jesus, as I mentioned this morning, I just want to read a few of these verses again. But Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And I give unto them eternal life. I mean, when you get saved, you're one of his sheep. Jesus identified that there was a wolf among the sheep from day one. He knew he was a devil, the Bible says. 
But he said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And I give them unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. You know, when the Lord comes back, he's going to uh, separate the sheep from the goats. He's going to she- separate the wheat from the tares. And there's going to be a bunch of tares mixed in on the harvest day. And that's those people who are going to say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many mighty works? I mean, there's going to be people out there who said, hey, I went soul winning. You know, I, I did what the pastor said. I read my Bible. I went to, down the road. I went, I went to help people. I, I did these things. But in their heart, they never believed, just like Judas. He says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Judas was not never one of Jesus' sheep, and if he was, he would have never got, been able to be plucked out of his hand. When Satan took possession of his body, that would be very symbolic of, you know, being uh, into somebody else's hand at that point, right? In John 13, 27, is, and it says this, And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. You know, go ahead. Do your worst. Go. Satan would have never been able to enter into that temple to possess that body because that body is, for a saved person, is where the Holy Spirit lives. You know, now I do believe that a devil, a devil or a demon could to could uh, oppress you. I believe that there's that's that's could happen. I think that there could be some something that the devil brings into your life that's hard. He he could tempt you. He could do those types of things, but he could never take possession. Praise God, because we are possessed of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you know, God the Father and God the Son have you in His hand. And then, then we are sealed by, until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. The whole Trinity is God is covered. <laughs> Turn over to Mark 13. People say, but of course he was saved. He was a disciple. You know? And here it, herein lies another false gospel. Now, the, the, the term disciple is just a follower of Jesus Christ. In Mark 3.13... It says, and when he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and he came unto him, and he had ordained twelve that they should be with him, that he might send for them forth to preach. And they'll say, well, look, God chose him. Okay. Well, he chose everybody to be saved. And he's listed as a disciple. So there it is. He's saved. But not only that, did you notice here that he sent them out that they might preach? And to have, verse 15, to have the power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Didn't the Bible say that in Matthew 7, that there would be many in his name that would even cast out devils and do mighty works in his name? And they say, Lord, Lord, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, Jesus never knew Judas. But yet he did things in Jesus' name. Verse 16 says, And Simon he called a surname Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and the surname uh, them uh, Borogenes, um, which is the son of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went in uh, into an house. So writing the story, looking back, they didn't write it while it was happening. They were going back and telling the story. Anytime you read Judas's name, it seems like they're always adding a little statement about him to say he was a bad guy. He was he was horrible. He was there from you know bad. He was the devil. He was uh, covetous and so forth. So here's the thing: the false gospels out there will often take what the Bible says um, that it has to that, that what it takes to be a disciple. So Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. He tells them, uh, you know, if you're going to be my disciple, if you love me, keep my commandments and all these, these things. And they'll say, see, see, see. But they'll say, they'll take what Jesus said that we have to do to be a disciple and apply that to how we get salvation. And this is pretty much uh, what the Lordship Salvation people do. This is what most of your, your cult, your, your groups out there that have a false gospel do. This is how they shoehorn in a work salvation into the gospel. And so they'll point out, you know, they'll say this guy was a follower. He did the works, right? You know, I mean, you know, these people are out there saying, 
you know, they'll, they'll muddy the gospel. They'll, they won't say, oh, you have to have works to be saved. But then they'll say, oh, look at that guy. He's got the good works. So, yeah, we could tell he's saved. Well, Judas had the good works. He went out with the, tw he was sent out two by two. He was out there doing the good deeds. He might have been doing some miracles. Okay. All right. But did that prove he was saved? No. He was putting that on. So works cannot, does not prove you're saved. So these false prophets, they'll sneak in a backdoor work salvation and say, well, if you are uh, saved, then you'll do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, you might just be doing X, Y, and Z to fit in. That's why a wolf puts on the sheep's clothing, like Judas did. You don't get saved by casting out demons or healing sickness any more than you get saved by making Jesus the Lord of your life. And committing your life to him and stopping sinning and all of that. Somebody could do that. Somebody could literally take, I mean, they say Gandhi, I don't even believe it, but they say he read it and believed like the teachings of Jesus. Or there's many people who like, oh, I like the teachings of Jesus. I don't believe in Jesus, but you know, I like his teachings. Well, you know, okay, I'm trying to follow Jesus' teaching. A lot of these people don't actually aren't actually trying to follow Jesus' teachings. But there are these like Bleeding heart liberals out there who are like, oh, yeah, we believe in Jesus. And they have their little long hair, hippie, you know, little rose in their hair, all that kind of thing. I was watching, um, I was talking to Pastor Fannin about this thing. There was this Jesus movement back in the 60s. And all these hippies were coming into this big church. Does anybody know, uh, they just made a movie about it. What, has anybody seen the ad for that movie, the hippie Jesus movie? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Um, what's, the, what's the name of the, the preacher that was so famous and he... Chuck Smith, that's it. Chuck Smith. Well, it turns out, you know, so it all started. He's like a, like a, some sort of conservative preacher. And this hippie walks in, and he's got this long hair down to his shoulders. He's wearing a dress. They got videos of him on YouTube, okay? And he, he gets up, and he's gaying the whole place up. I mean, he's up there, oh, Jesus this and Jesus that and everything. Turns out that guy was a homo the whole time. But he was the guy that started the Jesus movement, and they were getting all these hippies to come in as they were and leave as they were and all this type of stuff. Let me tell you, the Bible says there would be a lot of false prophets, a lot of false brethren. Okay? And I read an article. They said that it's funny how the new evangelical movement was basically started uh, by, a, by a homo, you know, a closeted homo. And they said, wow, how did this happen? With all the rock music in church and all this kind of stuff that, that they're doing today, it was all started by this, you know, Jesus movement guy. This, this uh, forget his name, but Chuck Smith's. Do you, have you seen that clip? Did I show you that clip, brother? You haven't seen it? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll send it to you. Anybody that wants to see that, I'll send it to you. But anyway, um, so look. You know, committing your life to Christ, stopping sinning, saying you like the prince, the things that Jesus taught. Oh, he's so loving and kind. It's funny how, you know, you get the reprobates out there telling us, well, Jesus would have never said that. So you haven't even read what Jesus said. You won't even want to read what Jesus said about you. <laughs> you know, and let me tell you what he's going to say about you uh, before too long. Um, but uh, anyway... You know, in Luke 14, 27, it says, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Oh, see? See? you got to bear your cross and come after him to be saved. No, to be a disciple, my friend. In Mark, uh, Luke 9, 23, he said, And he uh, said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. See? See? you got to... If you're going to come after Christ, you're, you're not really saved if you don't deny yourself every day and take up your cross. And, you know, so-and-so um, -so does that. I could see it. I would never. And, you know, it's funny because the disciples never really suspected Judas. I mean, Jesus practically fingered him. Said, that, hey, the next guy that sops the, the, uh, the, the roll in the cup is the guy. And uh, they're like, oh, why did, why did Judas just leave? Oh, he must, be going, he must be going to get some supplies. That's what the disciples thought. No, he was the guy. The Bible says in Luke 6, 40, And the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Uh, so you, if you take these verses, right, Luke 14, 33, And likewise, whosoever shall be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. The, the Catholics will, in some countries will literally just like, you know, just take razor blades and you know stuff and just 
whip themselves and cut themselves to pieces and crawl on their knees to please the Lord so they can be his disciple or whatever. And that's crazy. That's not even what he's saying here. But, but they're, that's what they are trying to do is please the Lord through the works of their flesh. And that is not how we're justified. The works of the law, the works of the flesh will never save us, never save you. The, see, being a disciple is a lifelong journey. It starts when we get saved. The first step of discipleship is when you step into the water to be baptized. But that, that baptism doesn't save you. It's, it is the first step of discipleship after you are saved. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Why was Judas chosen? Well, maybe, maybe he w- it was an example to show us that salvation is not of works. I mean, I think that that's possible. I mean, here is, you know, this, and that, even this, the most compelling example of following Christ and good works just might be the devil in disguise. Think about that. I mean, here is Judas. Now, he's not one of the 60. He's not one of the multitude. He's one of the 12. Well, I would never question him. I mean, he's right in there. He's like eating dinner with Christ. Like he's right in, the, in the, the inner circle. We know he's saved. No. And, and so no one fooled Jesus, obviously, but Judas, the Judases of this world can fool you and me. And that's why the Bible says to try the spirits to see if they can be, they are, they be of God. In Matthew 7, 15, it says, Beware of false prophets which come into you in sheep's clothing. And inwardly they are ravening wolves. And ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Verse 17. Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, and a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And every tree that bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Therefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So obviously if Judas was truly saved and then lost, right, it would con- contradict so many passages of scripture, clear scripture that say you can't lose it. But in reality, uh, these are people um, that just, you know, are false prophets. The Bible tells us that there are people in there saying, Lord, Lord, all day long. They're doing works in his name. They're prophets preaching in his name. They're even casting out devils in his name. I'm looking at the Catholic priest exorcists, you know, <laughs> and all the holy roller Pentecostals out there. And he says, I never knew you. I love that verse because if some, at the judgment, great white throne judgment of God, the people that are there never knew the Lord. That means you can't lose your salvation. The people who were there didn't say, I knew you, but I lo- you lost it. Now I don't know you. He said, I never knew you. All right. John 6. Let's turn over to John 6. John 6. This point, this next point out here is pretty simple. The Bible says many, verse 60, verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard of this, said, this is a hard saying, and who can hear it? And Jesus knew in uh, in himself his disciples murmured at it, and he said unto them, doth this offend you? And what, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who there were that believed not and who would betray him. So this verse alone right here proves that Judas was never saved. We could talk about the Satan entering his mouth. That proves it, you know. But the fact is the Bible said that Judas never believed. Faith alone is all that is required for salvation. And Judas didn't believe it. He didn't believe it. Oh, he said he did. He identified as a Christian. He identified as a believer in Christ. He followed in the inner circle. 
So there were many disciples that left Jesus, and we don't know who truly believes or not. Any, any of us, you know, we don't know who, who is actually truly believing in their heart. Because the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So somebody could say, Lord, Lord, and not believe it, which is Judas. Bible says in first, you know, we ask the question, so why, do, why don't the, the, we go by their works? Well, because their works can deceive you. What do we go by? Well, their profession. You know, that's all we can go by. So in 1 John 2, 18, it says, Little children, it is last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Listen, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that, that it might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And so Judas had this moment where he went out from them because he was not of them. In verse 65 of John 6, we're still there in John 6, it says, And he said, Therefore say, said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given uh, unto him of my father. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, think about this moment in time. A lot of the disciples just were like, yeah, we don't really believe. All right, we're gone. He says to the twelve, will ye go also, also go away? Simon Peter speaks up. Lord, whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And that's the right answer. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I love that. That's, that's our testimony. That's our, our profession of our faith. That's it. And Jesus answered and said, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Now, I, I believe that this indicates that not only is Judas... Uh, not saved, but I believe this indicates that he was a reprobate. <clears throat> he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So th think about it this way. You know, you've got this guy that enters in. Okay? Um, Jesus says, I've chosen one, and one of them is a devil. He let him in. This guy is literally an actor, a counterfeit, a fraud, a deceiver. Now, he chose one that everyone else saw as a believer, right? And he, I believe, and when you think about this, he, you know, he, profess, he had to profess Jesus Christ uh, to be this, you know, probably made statements similar to what Peter just made to be welcomed into that group. So he professed it, and he, and he took them based on their profession of faith. Took him based on his profession of faith. And so he allows this person in, but he allowed the guy into their midst, and I believe this was to fulfill a prophecy, the Bible says, and to be an eternal warning about false bre brethren that, are, that enter in unawares. In Galatians chapter 2, and we're going to turn over to Matthew 23. I'll read these, Galatians 2, 4. And he says, And, and that because of false brethren and, uh, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place to, by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So they were brought in unawares, Right? People didn't, wouldn't identify, but then there were, uh, was a point in time where they revealed themselves. And, you know, they were unawares brought in, but Peter, or Paul, excuse me, eventually identified them by their doctrine and by what they were believing and teaching and so forth. So let's look at the character of, of the false prophet Judas, and I believe that's what we see here. In Matthew 23, verse uh, 13, remember what the Bible says about false prophets. Because, I mean, this is, this is Judas... Uh, he's, he enters into the midst, not, he goes all the way up. I mean, there's not really a hierarchy, but I mean, he made it right into the inner circle of Jesus Christ. 
And then he's being sent out by Jesus. He's potentially doing miracles. He's preaching the gospel uh, in Jesus' name. And uh, he's prominent. He's the one that's got the bag and all of this. And this guy's this guy's a false prophet. He's he's preaching. I believe he's a you know he's preaching the gospel and all of this. He's doing all of this, and he's not even saved. He's a devil from the beginning. And the Bible says in Matthew twenty three thirteen, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them uh, that are entering uh, to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows houses and uh, for a pretense make long prayer therefore sh ye shall receive the greater damnation so there are people who uh, are religious they do their prayers and everything to be seen of men and yet they take advantage of people and take their money widows how widows and orphans and all this kind of thing look down at verse 24 ye blind guides which strain into that and swallow a camel Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and platter, but within they are full of ex uh, extortion and excesses. So the, the righteousness that they put on, that they, they, they externally show everybody in the world, they have an ulterior motive. We're going to read here in just a moment. We're going to go over to John chapter 12. But uh, the Bible tells us that, you know, Judas was the same way. He, he uh, put on... Um, the, uh, a face of righteousness, but he leaked out his true intents and motives. Within, they're full of excess and ex uh, extortion. In verse 27, look down there. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisee, hypocrite, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which in, indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within, you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So these Pharisees are, are right in the same boat as Judas here, where they are putting on a fake look. They are doing this. And in Luke chapter 16, to continue this thought, in verse 14, the Bible says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things and derided him. Now look at, uh, turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. In verse number 1, the Bible says, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was when he had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There, were, uh, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with, them, with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which uh, should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? It's like, well, you just blew 300 pence. And I don't know how much, I didn't look up how much that is, but I think those are uh, pieces of silver. <laughs> And this, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. So from day one, he enters into the whole, he makes it all the way up to uh, the, the disciples. He's a, one of the 12. He's in that inner circle with Jesus. He's a, he's a, the, a devil, the Bible calls him. Um, the Bible says that he was full of, you know, just deceit. And he's he's uh, ha has uh, nothing. He didn't care anything about the poor. He was just a thief, and he had all of these are uh, uh, alternative motives, right? And so it just points to it, all the indications point me to the fact that he was a reprobate. Um, like why why else would somebody do this? Just like the Pharisees, and a lot of people go into ministry we look at the Bible. if you read Jude chapter 2 and 2 Peter or Jude 2 2 Peter 2 and Jude okay there's no two chapters in Jude people are like pastor I couldn't find Jude 2 did I get the wrong Bible <laughs> yeah sorry um, but if you read those passages you'll see that these people have a, you know they put on an, an exterior of good works and good deeds but they're inwardly they are wicked 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 and so Jesus said uh said Jesus let her alone against the day of my bearing hath she kept this for the poor ye always ye have with you but not me ye not have not always so of course he he put him in his place and said this was a like a, a symbolic burial anointing and um 
it was a good thing that she did. But he didn't care about that. He just was like, ooh, she just, she just dumped 300 pence down the drain. What in the world? What a waste. He wanted that money so he could take, sneak his cut out of that. He could steal some out of that. Now, we saw this woman take a whole pound of spikenard. And, you know, wh why did you put it in the bag? I wanted to have it. Now, Zechariah said in 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 12, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for me my 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was uh, prized of them. And they took 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So this was a prophetic thing that happened. In Matthew 26, it says in 1 uh, verse 14, And one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they coveted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. In John chapter 13, uh, I've already read some of this, I believe. In John 13, 1, uh, 21, it says, And Jesus say, uh, had thus said, He was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Verse 22 says, Then the disciples looked on one another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. And Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it was or who should be the, of whom he spake. And then lying on Jesus' breast, uh, he then that lying on Jesus' breast said, said unto him, Lord, who is, uh, who is it? And Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop. And when I have dipped it, and when he uh, had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. And then said Jesus to, to him, unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him, for some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Now, turn over to Matthew chapter 27. We're getting close to the end here. But I think that we have a clear case laid out that Judas wasn't saved. But my question is, um, we, do, we know he wasn't saved, right? He didn't, definitely didn't lose his salvation. Uh, he was never saved. If he wasn't saved, he never was saved. Because once you're saved, you're always saved. But in John chapter, uh, or Matthew 27, um, you know, we'll talk about this just to kind of close up this idea here. But, but you know, we asked the question, was he a devil? Jesus said he was a devil. And Jesus knew he didn't uh, believe from the beginning. He wasn't a believer. The Bible says he entered in uh, for wicked reasons. I mean, the Bible says he was a thief and covetous. Um, and he he's, was sent out and preached in the ministry as, as a fake preacher. He was a false preacher the whole time. He didn't believe. The Bible says he didn't believe. He was preaching something he didn't even believe. So that puts him into the realm of somebody very nefarious and wicked. And you know, we need to keep that in mind. A lot of these TV preachers and preachers in these churches out here today, they are in it. You know, they don't believe. I think I was telling this story. I don't know. I was out soul winning. That was last Sunday, Malachi, I think it was. We talked to that Southern Baptist guy. I told the story on Wednesday. Maybe I'll just tell it again. But he said, he said to me, he said he went to a Baptist church, Southern Baptist church. And uh he, he was interviewing the pastor because he wanted to see, see what kind of church he was going to. And he said he was going to check different churches out. And he said, hey, do you believe in Jesus? He asked the pastor of a Southern Baptist church this. And he goes, well, well, what do you mean? The pastor said. He goes, well, I mean, I mean, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is, is God, you know, manifest in the flesh? And the pastor looked at him and said, Jesus was a good man. A Southern Baptist church. <laughs> and I said, that's crazy. A Southern Baptist pastor said that? He goes, yeah, you wouldn't believe what they're sending out of that seminary, the Southern Baptist seminaries. Man, that's why we're not Southern Baptist, amen? <laughs> yeah. 
Here he is, is in nefarious reasons. He wanted the money. He was covetous. He was wicked. He was sent out, preached in the ministry as a preacher with ulterior motives. And as soon as word got out that the Pharisees were looking to entrap Jesus, he went to them. He's like, how much will you give me? How much will you give me? But interestingly, he felt remorse for what he did. And I've wrestled with this. I've thought about this because some people will say, well, you know, he probably wasn't a reprobate because he seemed to remorse it. He felt bad about it. Let's read the passage in Matthew 27, verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See that uh, thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. All right. They'll, well, they'll say, but look, look at this guy. He's like feeling really bad that he betrayed Jesus. You know, that means he's still got some goodness in him or whatever. You know, it's like Darth Vader or something. Felt bad. He was whole life was given to the dark side. And there's some good hope in him or something. I don't know what the idea is there. But uh, let me read for another verse. Look down at verse number 9. The Bible says, Then was fulfilled that uh, which was spoken of by Jeremy the prophet, saying... And they took the 30 pieces of silver, and the price of him was valued, uh, that was valued, whom they gave the children of Israel to value, and gave them for a potter's field as the Lord appointed me. And so, so uh, I just wanted to, you know, kind of finish up the story. We've read most of the passages dealing with the Judas story there. Uh, so anyway, I believe that Judas was a devil. I don't believe he, the Bible says he never believed. He was never saved. It's, it, you know, it, he didn't believe. And I believe he was a son of Belial, personally. And, you know, again, some people will point to that, ver, that passage where his, he felt bad about it. And he, like, just gave the money back. And that money was used, you know, for the burial place and so forth. Um, but, you know, I, I, I kind of think that that was part of the punishment from God. And here's what I'm thinking is, you know, we, we, have, we have in our minds, right, that these people are past feeling and uh, their conscience is seared with like a hot iron. But here's something to think about, okay? Um, when, you know, I believe that these people that, that go beyond and God rejects and turns over to vile affections and reprobate mind, reprobates them, I believe they are tormented in their own sin. I believe they're tormented by it. Now they know their, I believe they know their behavior is disgusting and despicable. But they can't stop. I believe that's what being given over to a reprobate mind is, given over to vile affections. The Bible says in 2 Peter 2.14, having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin. They just can't stop. They can't help themselves. In Romans chapter 1, we'll finish with this passage, but it says in Romans chapter, turn over there real quick. The Bible says, you know, well, let me just have you turn there. This is our last verse, Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that, that do them. So, when Je you know, Judas went out and he was like, oh, I can betray Jesus, they're looking for him. It says he didn't know they were going to condemn him in that way. Like he didn't, I, I think he didn't realize what was, this was all going to lead to. And he was like, whoa. And it kind of makes me think sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, right? And, you know, now he has on his conscience, on his, you know, on his account, the, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He knew it was wrong. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they that commit such things are worthy of death. Not only did the same, but have pleasure in them to do it. The Bible talks about, in Proverbs 26, 11, as the dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. So the point is, is that there are people out there who will put on a very, very good facade. They'll put on the wolf, you know, the sheep clothing and mingle right in with the wolves. And Jesus gave us a, a really powerful uh, story about this for us to have a warning. Because there is a point where, you know, like Jesus did with his disciples, hey, some of you don't believe. Some of you got to go. You know, do all of you believe, he said, knowing that one of them was the devil. And so there's a point where somebody reveals themselves to be a Judas. They're no longer a part of us, right? And it's just sad to see that decline. You see people just destroying their lives in sin. You know, the average lifespan of a, of a, a reprobate, they say, is like 40 years or something like that. We're talking about a sodomite man. And um, it's, it's really sad to see the destruction of sin. Judas went out and ultimately hung himself. You know, one of the leading causes of death in that LGBT community is suicide. They, they, like to blame it on, they like to blame it on us. They'll say, well, you know, if they could just be accepted more, you know. Well, how, how much more do you want to be accepted? I mean... You know, you're on, the, you're on beer bottles and, you know, you're everywhere, you're everywhere. You just want to be accepted by the very, you know, very few people that won't accept you. Like, you, until it's ultimately all compliant. But it's, it's, it's killing them because they know how wicked they are. They know how wicked they are, but they cannot see sin. Why do they hate righteousness and goodness so much? Why do they hate kids so much? You know, that, why do they have, hate church and light so much? They know the truth of God, but they've turned from it. So, anyway, just, just some thoughts. Um, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm very clear we're not judging people by their works to see if they're saved, right? But sometimes people reveal themselves to be, you know, truly Judases, and, um, you know, it, it, it'll come out that they, they never believed, and that's, that's, uh, that's when we have to deal with it. We can't just sit there and look the other way like most of the churches are doing these days. Uh, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much, Lord, and we just thank you for your word. We do pray that you bless us as we go this afternoon soul winning and bless the, the events this weekend. And uh, thank, you for, thank you for all you do, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.